All right, I'm going to start off by giving a brief introduction to our fantastic panel that we have here tonight. I'm so delighted to bring this group of educators back here tonight to present the findings of the Wellbeing Systematic Review and and most importantly as well, I think, to have that practitioner voice about what does that mean for actual practice. So I'll just read out a brief bio for each of our speakers as a way of introduction. All right, so I'll start off with um, Dr. Catherine Dix, who is joining us from South Australia, and they're at, what was it, 36 today. So that's heading our way. So thanks everyone that's joining us from there in that heat. Um, Dr. Catherine Dix is a Senior Research Fellow in the Education Monitoring and Research at ACER, where she's worked since 2017. She br brings diverse experience in project managing and evaluating national school-based initiatives and teacher professional development programs. Dr. Dix has had extensive experience in questionnaire design, love questionnaire design, large-scale survey implementation and real-time reporting, along with expertise in many online platforms. She has designed numerous questionnaires in the space of early childhood, school and higher education contexts for data-driven improvement, really focused in on for evaluation. She also has extensive experience in, oh, sorry, statistics, I mean, it's the best, and multi-level modelling, which is, to me, the best of the best. Um, I'm getting too excited. And uses these to pursue her strong interest in impact research and the factors that most importantly um, optimise student outcomes, because that's what we all hear really about tonight. So welcome, Dr. Dix. Fantastic to have you here with us tonight. Now, to introduce Michael, um, we're incredibly pleased that Michael could join us again. He's the Assistant Principal at Wodonga Senior Secondary College in regional Victoria, so similar temperature to us, the passionate educator um, and educational leader and a teacher of physics, multimedia and mathematics with over 10 years' experience working in schools. He was seconded to the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority for two years as a STEM specialist teacher, and he has sat on the Science Teachers Association of Victoria's Council for seven years. And I'm a science teacher too, so awesome to have you here, Michael. Um, so Michael regularly presents at educational conferences and is a contributing author to two high school physics books. I don't know how you find the time, Michael. Michael is a passionate advocate for those experience social economic disadvantage and for students in regional and rural and remote settings. So prior to working in schools, Michael worked as an aerospace, so cool, automotive and software industries in Germany, USA and Australia. And then my favourite degree, Michael holds a degree of a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering, it's best title, Bachelor of Business from RMIT University and a Graduate Diploma of Education from Monash University. I went to Monash. Very welcome to have you here, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And last but certainly not least is my colleague from Evidence for Learning, and that is Dr. Pauline Ho. So Pauline has been working at Evidence for Learning and she oversees the evaluation and trials under the Learning Impact Fund since 2017. She was a research fellow and brings extensive experience in managing large scale and national evaluations in education and health and is passionate about using strong evidence to develop effective solutions for implementation in schools and also for policy. Prior to this, Pauline was a secondary school teacher um, and curriculum specialist in music and English in Singapore. 
And Pauline holds a PhD in education from the University of Sydney. Her thesis investigated the impact of policy and curriculum on academic and social outcomes of disadvantaged students and was recognised for several fellowship awards. So really warm welcome to everyone here tonight and really happy to be part and facilitating this amazing panel. So welcome from, from China, just came onto our screen. Thank you for joining us. So for me personally, um, I'm standing on the lands in Melbourne um, and these are the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I heartfeltly express and pay my respects to the elders past, present and most importantly those that are emerging and you're all meeting on different traditional lands across Australia and across the world so we recognize those as well tonight in this webinar. So I'm just going to share a brief overview of our approach tonight in the webinar. So we'll really be looking to be as practical as possible to you the profession tonight looking at recommendations for yourselves as educators and school leaders. That's why we're so keen to have someone like Michael on our panel tonight to really have that evidence to practice element. And excitedly, I think, and I, it, I think it's a very beautiful and exciting systematic review on wellbeing. So we'll be presenting those findings. Um, Pauline and Dr. Dix will be talking to those. Um, Dr. Dix is the lead author on that alongside her team as well. And it's to me, it's a very impressive and beautiful piece of work. So excited to be delving into that tonight. We're hearing about implementation strategies that are most effective and how they can be implemented. So we're we'll going into some examples of wellbeing and, and, and what you can do with that at your school. And then thinking about what does that practically mean for you? Then we're going to go to answer the questions that have been submitted by you all. And then we're gonna to go to a live Q and A if we have time, which we will, I'm sure, I'm sure. So Pauline, I'll hand over to you to give an introduction to the study that was conducted. Thanks, Tanya, and welcome everybody again. So here we are, this is the second webinar on wellbeing, student wellbeing particularly. And we are here because we're so encouraged to see such an incredible response to the systematic review. Um, as Tanya said, it's an impressive piece of work, not because I worked on it, but because I'm, we love data. And the fact that a systematic review is so well executed by uh, this team, truly impressive. And we are, we, we are really grateful for this opportunity to share these findings with you. And it's also, also a very important priority for schools right now as we're delighted to share this evidence and how it actually helps to guide our decisions for our students. When we started this piece of work in late 2019 together with ACER as well as Big Health, we had no clue that the pandemic was about to affect us all. Seriously, we, we were all you know, uh, really um, kind of taken by shock by this pandemic. But Looking back, we are really grateful that we started this piece of work. And if anything, the pandemic really pushed us to work even harder to get this done well. So um, we know that well-being programs, you know, do help children and young people, people become better learners. But there's very little robust evidence to, that really answer this question. So the key question around this systematic review is to understand the extent of the impact on well-being and how it not just improves well-being, but also academic outcomes. So it may or may not. When we start out, we don't know the answer, but now we do. And Catherine will share those findings with you very soon. Uh, what we did was there were 4,000 over studies that were being screened. So we went to database, um, the research team, Catherine and team looked through 4,000 over studies, bring it down to 75 very high quality studies in order to sieve up the best available evidence around this work. And altogether, there were 432 outcomes that were extracted, 126 of them are academic outcomes, 306 of them were well-being outcomes. Um, the study looked at school-aged children and we were only interested in school-based interventions. 
well-being related intervention. So no other age range in the university or tertiary sector were involved in this study. And a majority of the studies were from the US and UK. And very interestingly, only one Australian study made it into the meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis where you actually bring together and calculate the mean effect size across all these studies to come up with an average effect. And only one um, of the Australian study met the selection criteria. And if you are really interested, please read the report to find out a bit more about the methodology. But um, basically, it's a very comprehensive meta um, analysis of the evidence on health and well-being um, that covers seven school-based intervention types from mentoring school and um, engagement and belonging to SEL, social emotional learning, as well as physical activity. And uh, those of you who are very familiar with the space of evidence, most of the evidence focus on one specific approach, but in this systematic review, which we think is the global first of its kind, brings together all types of well-being related intervention into one study. Over to you, T. Oh, so that's me as well. So <laughs> on resources, we are very delighted to provide all these resources to you to build on some of this understanding on what works. Now we have the social emotional learning toolkit um, strand, which shows a plus four moderate months of impact on learning. And it's very, very rigorous based on quite strong security evidence. Uh, but we also have in the coming few weeks or months, which Susanna can tell you more in the chat box, we have a social and emotional learning um, guidance report that's coming out. And this guidance report will build a lot on the toolkit strand evidence um, the recommendations from our partner in the UK, the Education Endowment Foundation, as well as the latest systematic review findings. Um, so please hop onto the website to take a look at some of these resources. Um, what we have here on the student health and wellbeing systematic review are three types, three key artifacts. So we have the main report on the right hand side, which is executive summary, as well as the main technical report, of all data um, and technical evidence around this work. But if you are someone who would just want to get quick you know, into the key messages of what the findings are telling us, on the left-hand side, we have the set of evidence infographic, which talks about the six key messages. And I love the one in the middle, which is an impact map of all the effect sizes. It's interactive. You could move the cursor around to find out what, where the biggest impact and greatest impact is versus the lesser impact. So over to you, Tanya. And I'll hand over to Dr. Um, Dix now to run us through the key findings of the report. Certainly, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so firstly, what I want to stress is that the studies that made it into this systematic review were there because they weren't an example of the best intervention type with the greatest impact, they were there because they had the best study design. So that's something that sets systematic reviews apart. It's not just going out and collecting any evidence, it's collecting the best evidence. And this, almost for the first time, does give us very firm understandings around to what extent, um, in a global, broader sense, um, wellbeing has you know, wellbeing interventions impact on student wellbeing outcomes and also on their academic achievement. Because we know for a long time there's been, you know, knowledge and understanding that you know, happy kids are better learners. Um, but this brings together that really nice um, piece of work where we're looking for the best evidence of that relationship and then actually bringing that evidence together. So it's not just based on one study, it's actually based on 78 different studies from all over the world. So it's really, this whole piece of work was really almost establishing um, the strength of that relationship. So what this means is that almost, you know, what you're doing in your classroom, what you're doing in your school around whole, promoting whole school wellbeing and supporting students' wellbeing um, is critical to improving academic outcomes. What we found from the review, um, we didn't know what we were gonna get. We didn't know what final 78, whatever the magic number of articles was um, that we would include in this final uh, analysis. Um, and so when we did result, uh, arrive at that final list, 
um, you know, 78 of them, they were all sorts of different types of interventions, you know, um, ones from ranging from horses, you know, an equine for students with um, autism and reducing their anxiety through to, you know, mass anxiety tests with a one hour intervention before the actual test, you know, so, so the, the, the scope was huge. Um, and so that, that presented a, a, the first challenge for us, which was actually how can we organise and arrange these studies, these types of interventions to try and put them into some sort of accessible, easy you know, way to, to make sense of what it's telling us. Um, and, you know, the, the mentoring ones jumped out straight away. You know, it was quite easy to see, right, this is a mentoring intervention. Let's group all of those together. Um, and then there were um, interventions that specifically focused more around belonging and school engagement. So they sort of grouped themselves together. And so we worked through that sort of almost thematic analysis of, of working where, where are their commonalities with these different intervention types and how can they be brought together. And because we came at it from not a specific, most systematic reviews focus on one very narrow intervention like mindfulness, for example, or reducing bullying intervent, you know, problems. Um, and so that, you know, all of the other types of wellbeing and elements of wellbeing are put to one side. They sit in an, another piece of work. This was the first time where we came at, we didn't care what the intervention was, as long as the study was robust in terms of it being a random control trial um, or a quasi-experimental design. So you've got that control treatment group but also that the study had to report an academic outcome and it had to report a wellbeing outcome. And I'll get to those in a, a minute. So that's how we got down to our 78 studies. And you can see here that um, by far the majority of them were focused around improving mental wellbeing through mentoring, through supporting a child's connection to school. Um, there were interventions that focused specifically on social emotional skills, and that's the, the greater majority of them. So you're starting to get a sense of well, what types of interventions are out there um, and, and what areas of, of, of well-being are they addressing. Um, 13 studies looked at cognitive, developing cognitive skills um, like uh, attention, um, uh, yeah, those, those sorts of areas. Um, eight studies focused on behavioural skills. So, you know, were they sort of reducing aggression, you know, um, increasing pro-social behaviour um, with other students, et cetera. Um, we also looked at physical type activities. So um, yoga, uh, I think there's massage in there, you know, um, so that sort of exercise and rela re relaxation became a category. Um, and then we we're also very interested in interventions that, focused on reducing risky behaviour, so um, prevention from harm, tobacco, alcohol and drugs. So programs like Life Education Ban, you know, and Healthy Harold Bus, um, ordinarily that program would sit in there, but they haven't done a rigorous evaluation, so they didn't make it into, into the list. So you can see, even though it's a really good program, it unfortunately it didn't make it into the list. So that gives you a bit of an insight as to the types of evidence that we've brought together. Now, within those um, programs, uh, we tried to look for characteristics and group characteristics. So what type of design was the research? Um, what types of settings did they address? Was it targeting pro, uh, primary school students? Was it targeting secondary school students? And then therefore, was there a difference in the way um, those programs had that impact? Um, we were looking at also whether it was a teacher delivered, meaning that the teacher gained professional development first and built their capacity, and then they took that into the classroom. So we call that sort of indirect delivery because it's indirect to the student versus um, programs like, you know, Life Education Van, that a professional um, presenter delivers the program directly to the child, you know, um, and we wanted to look to see if there was any influence or, or different outcomes on the basis of mode of delivery. And you've got, we've got some other areas that we looked at there as well. So on the other end, um, as I said, we were looking for articles that, uh, studies that had wellbeing outcomes and academic outcomes. And we were able to extract out of those papers um, 306 wellbeing outcomes 
And again, there were all sorts of things, you know, executive function, anxiety, um, you know, engagement, um, the, the sense of developing social emotional skills, you name it, they, they were all, all over the place, nearly not unique in every single one, but it really was a clear indication as to how messy this world is, this well-being world is. We, we still don't really actually have a clear definition of what student well-being is, let alone how to measure it. So, you know, this, this, this came through in spades with this piece of work. Um, but again, we attempted to group these things together um, and categorise them into social emotional adjustment, behavioural adjustment, cognitive adjustment and internalising symptoms. So the internalising symptoms were things like um, depression, you know, that more of that sort of pointy end um, levels of things. Uh, and then academic outcomes were way easier. So we needed a nice standardised measure of academic achievement. So something like NAPLAN, you know, it, it generally fell into the category of either being a literacy outcome, a, a literacy, literacy assessment or, or a me measure of numeracy mathematics, um, or there was that sort of GPA type assessment that was just general academic achievement. So we're able to categorise all of the outcome, academic outcomes into three categories. Which, which was lovely, <laughs> you know, and, and shows just how further advanced that domain, you know, our understanding of how to assess um, academic achievement is um, in terms of, uh, it, you know, our sophistication and understanding of how to test these things and measure these things. Um, so you can see there from that, sorry, that there were not large effect sizes, um, but, you know, all of them were in the positive relationships um, you know there was impact from these interventions on one side uh, in terms of developing social emotional skills um, to 0.19 um, effect size uh, etc so yeah I just wanted to kind of draw your attention to that thanks Tanya this is me again I can't oh, I haven't got the order in front of me sorry um, so wellbeing interventions do make a difference to student outcomes. So that was the first real key take home message. What you do does matter in the classroom. Um, how you support student wellbeing is really important. Um, and it, it can be something that, that should be something that is actually just an integrated part of your classroom. You know, it's not a little right now we're going to go and do some wellbeing. Um, it's much better. Um, you can imagine if it, if it just is, you know, the culture of your classroom. Um, students were up to four months ahead in learning um, compared to students in the control groups on their wellbeing outcomes. So what we were able to do was take this effect size, the 0 .0, 0 0.31 effect size, and there is a, a metric, a table that converts, just, just to give you, you know, because if you turn around and say, well, what does 0 0.31 mean? you know, in the real world. Um, it's nice if we can convert it into something in the sense of, you know, further improvement or above and beyond. You know, what's the value add? The control groups sit here with their wellbeing. The students in the interventions were a few months ahead equivalent um, in terms of their, their wellbeing, whatever that means. It's a, it's a hard thing to grasp with, but... It is that notion of, you know, being four months ahead in learning in a particular domain. So if we could take the, the academic domain and, and sort of reflect it back onto a sense of well-being skills, you know, skill development, um, can a child be four months ahead in their skill development compared to another child? Um, and you can see that um, interventions that had moderate positive impact on student well-being um, and those that promote social emotional skills um, really positively impacted literacy and numeracy with gains of um, plus two months um, there. So everything that schools do to support student wellbeing counts, um, you know, and we found that of the different intervention types, um, school belonging and engagement, mentoring and social emotional skills seem to um, do a little bit more in terms of achieving student wellbeing outcomes. We also found that disadvantaged students benefited most from tailored support, as you can imagine. Um, programs designed to assist disadvantaged students were effective in reducing behaviour problems and internalising symptoms such as anxiety and depression. So 
you know, one of the big key messages is that, yes, we need an overall systemic approach to wellbeing throughout the school, but within that um, broad universal approach, um, it's really important to also have some of those tailored programs that really do support um, students that have those additional needs. So in terms of what it might look like in a school, um, it's pretty much what I just said, uh, but picking up on some of those other things. So things that we found were features of the um, interventions that seem to have greater impact. Um, they were short and delivered within a term. This, this isn't to say that long interventions are bad, not at all. It's just to say that interventions that were shorter in nature, I think are more manageable. Um, they are something that can be integrated into a, a crowded curriculum more easily. And so it becomes a method of being able to sustain and maintain that um, intervention. Uh, it's just more manageable for teachers. It was really important um, that the programs did have some universality to them uh, and that it's building awareness of, and capacity within the whole school community. So you're not just picking targeted programs for those kids, which continues to stigmatise those children. Um, and it's really important to, to, to break down the stigma that still sits around um, mental health and wellbeing. You know, if everyone's more comfortable with talking about it, then people are more able to... Um, you know, understand the importance of, of trying to improve well-being and mental health uh, and then take actions towards that. Um, it's programs that were explicitly taught by the trained classroom teacher um, seem to be slightly more effective than the um, ones that were specifically uh, targeting students. So I, that was quite a surprise to me. You would have thought the sort of more intense program from the trained professional is going to have a better in, impact on students. But it turns out that capacity building teachers first means that they can take that learning and understanding and um, promote it throughout their pedagogy, throughout their teaching and do it in a sustained long-term way. So it's not just a burst of information that the student gets they're getting ongoing opportunity to um, be in a context that supports their wellbeing, but also having those ongoing opportunities to try, uh, test and improve their own um, understanding and practice, you know, some of those, you know, skills that they are developing around um, social emotional behaviour, uh, etc. So, you know, that gets to that second point about regular sessions. Um, is important so students do have the opportunity to practice and learn from each other and learn with each other. Um, again, building that common understanding and expectation of behaviour, um, you know, within the classroom. Um, by delivering to groups of students, that was an interesting one. So really big groups didn't seem to have, were, didn't seem to be quite as effective um, as small to middle sized groups. So. Uh, it's that notion that, you know, if you're in a really big group and you're a quiet child, you're, you're less likely to engage. You're more likely to not speak out, not um, put forward thoughts, you know, and, and engage with the actual program. If it's in smaller groups that are a little bit more, um, you know, just a small number of students, then the, everyone's more willing to engage and, and um, contribute to, to the learning that, that's happening. Um, if you're going down to one-on-one, -on -one, that's a different thing again, and that can be quite confronting for some students. So, so that small to middle, you know, if you're in a classroom setting, it might be good to break students up into a number of groups rather than do it to the whole class, for example. You know, it might be easier for some students to engage in the, the skill development uh, in that sort of context where they're um, not feeling like they've got to talk to a whole classroom. Um, and yeah, dev developmentally differentiated is really important. So recognising that influence, sorry, recognising that wellbeing um, is different for kids at different stages in their development. You know, teenagers have a different set of needs around their wellbeing um, compared to, you know, kids in primary school. Thank you so much, um, Catherine and Pauline, for that introduction. 
that was just really rich and I think really practical recommendations for educators, which is really always the goal is what does that evidence actually mean for practice? So I think you really hit that well. So thank you so much for taking the time for taking us through the findings. Now we're going to move to questions that we've received from you, the audience, that you've sent in and addressing those from our panel. So we'll start off with um, talking to Michael and really about his context there at Wodonga Secondary, um, Senior Secondary College. Um, and we know that at that school, there's 77% of your students, Michael, um, come from the lowest quarter of socioeconomic um, Adva educational advantage. So we're really looking at those that are surrounded by disadvantage there. So really within this role, you've had an increased focus in on social emotional wellbeing. Can you outline some of the strategies that you've implemented at your school? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Tanya. And um, I guess for a bit of a bit more context on the school, I mean, we're a large senior secondary, and as Tanya pointed out, we have a large disadvantaged cohort. So um, and the background is for many years, we really have put a, a big emphasis on students' wellbeing and looking after that. So um, we, we um, thankfully to some equity funding and so forth, are pretty well resourced in terms of addressing specific mental health needs. And um, we have allied health professionals in the school um, and we've used things like teen mental health first aid to train all of our staff and regularly. And they have those sorts of processes in place for dealing with those um, acute, I guess, wellbeing issues. Um, but I guess I'll share a bit more now about um, the experience this year and the things we've put in place this year. So um, like many or like all schools in Victoria, we've had two, two good rounds of remote learning this year. Um, and we also started the year in our context with some, um, some bushfires and so forth. So we were really aware at the start of this year that our staff and students were absolutely exhausted um, from the, the very difficult summer. Um, when we came to school in February. So when the pandemic came around, um, we did a really big piece of work around looking at what, how to prioritise the work for us to do um, and how to ensure we all our students could be successful during um, an unknown duration remote learning of unknown uh, nature. So um, very early on, we looked at what was the full picture of the needs of our students and looking at some... Uh, research and emerging perspectives, we came up with this model you can see on the screen um, around all the different needs that our school is supporting our students with, from basic mental health and wellbeing to safety and security, recognising for many students the school is, is their safe place, but also has something to do with physical health, connectedness, um, and obviously the importance of engagement and learning, um, aspirations and pathways, particularly being a senior secondary where our students are very much orienting towards their next steps. Um, and also the role of medical cognition and self-regulation, particularly in remote learning um, and obviously academic learning growth. So in developing this model, we then did some work around how we were structuring our week. So we um, significantly changed our week in remote learning. Um, cutting by more than half the you know, face to face time in a sense uh, and putting in more breaks, um, putting in more flexibility for students, putting in independent learning time uh, where students could have some flexibility. And, um, and I guess that also was really important looking at that whole picture of our students, recognizing that students had other duties, other, other roles to fulfill in their life, which are really important. They may have been caring for other family members. Um, they may have been a even more significant income earner in their family because of the pandemic. They're getting shifts at Woolies when mum and dad have been laid off. So, um, you know, having that flexibility in the week so the kids, the students could rearrange what they're doing and giving them that trust, um, which empowered them to... Uh, you know, take responsibility for their learning, really important there. So those sorts of things about changing the whole structure of the week and putting this model front and centre to our parents, to our staff and to our students and saying all of these needs matter, um, which also gave our staff permission to do what they do really well and what they always do, which is to consider the full picture of our students, not just uh, how they're going academically. Um, and one of the other important things we put in place was a regular check-in with staff and students. Um, so by reprioritizing roles within the school, things like ES staff, our, our um, fantastic lab tech, for example, science teachers will appreciate that, um, 
were used to do weekly check-ins with um, families. So every family was getting a phone call once a week um, from someone in the school, ES staff and other staff doing that. Um, and every student was getting a, a phone call from the, what they would call their graduate program teacher, which is like a pastoral care type program that they teach they stay with for their three years. And every staff member was getting a phone call from uh, someone in the principal class. So um, through all of those things, ensuring that we also had that one-on-one -on -one check in um, and really reprioritizing a lot of the things that we did. And, you know, without going for too long here, really, really pleased to say that, um, you know, our students have engaged really well throughout round one and round two of remote learning. I mean, uh, some people might have thought initially that our disadvantaged cohort would just uh, switch off, um, but they didn't. They stayed with us and they engaged really, really well. And, um, you know, it's interesting to reflect earlier on in the webinar talking about that potential for wellbeing interventions to give maybe a four month academic gain. Uh, when we look at the setting of this year and people's concerns about academic loss and setting aside there's other research you can look at from Hattie and so forth suggesting that's not even a concern necessarily in, in the case of lost teaching time. But you know, effective wellbeing intervention could well overcome the, uh, the lost teaching time from this year. So um, it'd be interesting to see obviously what the final outcomes look like, um, but look in terms of the outcomes that we uh, are already tracking in terms of our students, their well-being, um, their health and well-being, and also their, you know, their access to pathways, the retention, that ongoing engagement. It's been really successful. I could talk about it for a couple of hours, but um, I'm aware that uh, we do have a time limit. So I'll stop for more questions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you so much um, for really diving into some great detail, especially in, in your response to what has been probably yeah, the hardest year for uh, a hundred years, at least. Um, so, and the emphasis that you've put on social emotional wellbeing, and I, I really appreciate the dynamic approach that you took, especially in response to what you knew was the complexities that surrounded your students' background. So the flexibility, I think, in the learning um, was really valued would have been really valued because then that meant that they could still continue on, as you mentioned the example, and, and earn a wage when family members had been laid off in this incredibly difficult time for the world and um, Victoria in that point as well. So thank you for taking the time. And I wish we could go for a couple of hours, but... <laughs> but we better not. Um, so, and some of you have already started to do this. So thank you very much. Um, please put in questions into the chat box as we go, um, as to anything you'd like us to answer. So, and this really feeds off, um, Michael, your last point really well, and you've addressed um, some of this already, I think really in the use and the dynamic use of the staff and within your school, such as the weekly check-ins. I wonder if you had any other um, points for what that looked like. What about for your teachers? How was that implemented on the ground, really, that focus in on wellbeing in this incredibly difficult time and, and adding in, as you mentioned before, that the fact of the bushfires had preceded this for regional um, Victoria. I mean, yeah, in terms of teacher wellbeing is one part of it. Um, we certainly were already aware that we needed to look after our staff this year and that was even more uh, apparent. So we um, uh, very proactively repurposed our use of time for staff. So um, PLCs are a really big uh, use of a priority in terms of our use of those two hours of meeting time that we would have in a government school in Victoria. So we do have at least one hour a week dedicated to PLCs and we really refocused our PLCs this year on staff supporting each other. So that was a sort of a secondary support for staff in addition to that weekly check-in with someone from the print class, um, which I might add every time they asked how we were doing every single check-in they asked about us uh which is lovely but That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> um having their weekly plcs dedicated to supporting each other and and just um also checking in on each other which worked really well because also to acknowledge in this year um, it's interesting to talk about teachers and their PD this year. I mean, that, the, the amount of learning that's been done, and that was just really good for people to support each other with their learning. Um, and we really cancelled any other meetings we could 
uh, except for the absolute most essential things, a few briefings. Um, and another thing really in shifting a lot of our work, our collaboration and our work together online, um, we really made it clear that things needed to be short, just as our digital delivery to students needed to be less than 30 minutes per session. Um, our digital interactions with colleagues needed to be less than 30 minutes. So we couldn't be having long meetings or long discussions and a lot of things shifted in the form in which they took place, which, um, yeah, was really, really, um, really, really helpful. Um, and I think people have actually stuck with that too. A lot of these things, uh, this stuff is relevant to the non pandemic crisis situation uh, as well. Um, and a lot of these things have stuck during our return and our current return to on site. Um, and people are having shorter meetings and we have reprioritized things and it's staying, a lot of that stuff is staying. Um, I noticed you've met the, the, on the slide that also mentioned the digital divide. And um, yeah, for us that, that has been important. Um, and again, I think we are, you could say lucky, but also this is a, there's an effect of, a, of planning and, and organization in the school. Um, we have very effective IT supports in place. So um, before the kids went remote the first time, we had surveyed every single student to find out what their IT needs were um, in terms of laptop and internet access and um, study situation at home. So we were able to intervene and support very, very quickly. So we got all our kids online uh, very, very quickly within a week of being in remote learning, everyone had a, an internet dongle of some form and people donated them and the department gave us them as well. So we were very well supported there, but we really overcame that digital divide in that sense. Um, probably the one aspect that was always challenging and remains so in remote learning was that some students just didn't have, um, you know, the, the best study, in, they, they just didn't have an environment, they didn't have a space, they didn't have a quiet space, they were, you know, looking after a sibling and those things, you know, and we, I guess another thing within this whole picture of well-being, is as leaders in the school and with our teachers to look at um, modelling the focus on what we can change and what we can't change and accepting those things that we can't do anything about and just working with what we can. So uh, I think that also as leaders modelling that and obviously uncertainty has been a big feature of this year and, and that can be hard to deal with in terms of wellbeing. So modelling that way of dealing with uncertainty in terms of accepting it and communicating clearly when we can and accepting what we don't know and moving on, so yeah. Yeah, it's really focusing in on that locus of control and what you can and can't control. And for this year, um, it has felt like that, that <laughs> locus of control has, has shrunk somewhat. Um, but it's really fantastic to hear the way that you use that. And, and for anyone that might not know, so it's professional learning community time, PLCs in Victoria is dedicated um, and every system will have a different name for that potentially. That, that, that was dedicated to check-ins and um, also the the shorter meetings too. I think that's that's something every every sector can benefit from really, isn't it? A shorter meeting. Um, oh, and, focus, <laughs> <laughs> and having the teachers, I could imagine the teachers too, because it, it's been, uh, having to work from home is very disconnecting. Um, it's been very disconnected for, for teachers to try and do their job remotely. So if they could have that as check-in time would have been, yeah, just really fantastic. Yeah. Um, and now I'll turn to you, Pauline, and ask you to provide a bit of background um, to the impacts of the educational crisis or the predicted impacts of the educational crisis um, for this year. Thanks, Tanya and Micah. It's really reassuring to hear all the good stuff that your school has been doing to scaffold, not just for the students, but for the teachers as well. So the, I just want to just quickly go through this, not really in depth, because it's just a whole, you know, different direction of research, which if you are interested, is really uh, fascinating as well. But the outbreak of this pandemic on school disruption has been unprecedented as all, all of us know, and no previous disasters or pandemic can, can give us a kind of direct application of the evidence to what is happening right now. But we can really draw from existing uh, evidence of longitudinal studies that have been done on like, you know, the bushfires, the Black Sunday bushfires in Victoria, Hurricane Katrina, where displaced students experience post-traumatic stress disorder way many years down the road. So some of these effects we might not see now, but there might be um, you know, long-term effects on students if we do not 
grab this opportunity to really um, mitigate the risk to such factors. So I, I just want to highlight that there are, I'm an optimist just like Michael, you know, and, and many of us here who try to find solutions. And I think that the more, the more time that students spend away from schools, the higher the risk to learning and exposure of the violence and abuse that might be expected in very disadvantaged communities. And also with the loss of incomes of parents and them being the significant, maybe the significant income earner in the family. And all these things might have an impact in compounding issues for their learning as well when they return back to schools. So what can we do? Uh, being optimist, I just want to just highlight that maybe it's important for us all to think about the recovery process and having the targeted support for students who might uh, who might need it more than the others. The, the minority, I mean, many of them might thrive and, and do well in remote and online learning, but there is a, there is a minority of students who, who sh should not be forgotten in this um, in this situation that we're in right now. And also teachers are subjected to all these challenges, them being um, part of this pandemic. We are, we are, we need to be also mindful of our own, I know, like emotional, uh, emotional state and how we are, we are, how we can support ourselves and our colleagues and students as well um, to, to get through these pressures. Um, and, and some of this might also, you know, be, be I mean, Catherine might have talked about in terms of the professional learning, the capacity building of teachers being really critical to support students. Um, if we are not prepared and not ready to, to do some of these programs interventions well, uh, it, it, it might not uh, give us the maximum impact that it might have on our students. Thank you, Pauline. And, and now I'll turn to um, Catherine and just talk a little bit about reflections on the systematic um, review and drawing from your extensive research in this area. Catherine, are there any particular advice that you can offer to teachers and leaders about the best way to improve students' wellbeing in a time of crisis? Yeah, certainly. Um, and I do wanna just pick up on one of Michael's comments. Um, obviously, teachers have to look after their own wellbeing first. Um, and you know, once they're looking after that, they're in a much better position to look after the well-being of their school community more broadly, but also their, their students specifically, and to really keep an eye out for, for students that might be struggling um, is really important. Uh, what we did find was that um, another, you know, we're, we're working across lots of different projects um, at ACR. So one of them, for example, is the Smiling Mind program. Um, you know, which is a sort of mindfulness-based type program that's designed to support well-being, um, improve mental health, uh, and perfectly, uh, perfectly nice program that you could practice yourself. It's an app, you know. So there's lots of tools out there, you know, um, at, at, that are targeting um, the professional, targeting the teacher that you can use. We also know that um, the Department of Health has kicked in a large bucket of money into the development of the um, BU program, um, which are some of these slides that you're seeing uh, come from that. Um, you know, make use of taxpayer funding <laughs> is what I can say. There's, there's a series of online learning modules to help you to work through and get your head around what is whole school mental health promotion and what it looks like. Um, and we're also in the process of evaluating that program at ACER. And um, you know what, what we have noticed during the COVID um, period and the pandemic is just the absolute spike in the number of teachers registering, going online, reading, looking at the resources and building their own capacity around understanding uh, mental health and wellbeing and how to support students in the classroom. So, you know, in some of that downtime there, they've had the opportunity to go and do some of that professional development for themselves and it's there freely available. Um, so I'm not suggesting that's the program you go to, but go and have a look for those sorts of programs to, to take a moment. I, I know it's so hard, teachers expected to do everything, um, you know, and yet this is just another thing they've got to deal with and, and build their capacity around. But um, I think, you know, this is one area that really is going to reap those rewards, not only for you as a teacher, um, because you know your classroom is a healthy, happy place, but also for the students that are going to benefit from that knowledge and understanding that you have. Um, you know, beyond your own capacity, uh, developing your own capacity, 
um, there are a suite of programs out there that are available in Australia to, to specifically focus and target on different areas of improvement that you might like to see in the school. So um, as part of the, the BU um, platform, they have a programs directory. Um, as at the moment, it sits at 206 programs that are listed in the directory. Uh, as of tomorrow, they're relaunching the directory and it's going to be uh, only including 40 programs. So <laughs> that will be interesting. Um, those programs though that are in there are going to be uh, strongly sort of validated and evidence-based. Um, the, the remainder of the programs are not going to be lost to oblivion. I think they're going into some other, other list, um, probably still yet to be properly reviewed uh, and, and then they'll make it to the list of 40 at the moment. But um, importantly, out of the work we did, we did go through as part of the systematic review um, all of those um, programs and had a quick look at the evidence base behind them. And, you know, there is the, the addendum that allows you to have a look at the, the programs that are out there that are bounce back, that are, you know, you can do it program, all of those sort of programs you're probably familiar with. Um, you can go and find out which one's the best fit for your school, um, where are your problem areas in the school and, and, and what, what programs are available to the school um, to support that kind of improvement around either bullying or, you know, building resilience, etc. So, so I recommend that you go and have a look at that programs list if you are looking for um, programs that might help promote uh, wellbeing in the classroom. Um, as part of the systematic review, uh, we did... You know, we, I thought it might be useful to break into one of the one section. I think we've got two examples here, actually. So this one's looking at that belonging and engagement type programs. And just to give you a bit of a sense that there were five papers that fell into that category. Um, you can see uh, we, we looked at where they were from. Um, we can we captured information about the numbers of students involved, the numbers of schools involved. So sort of key characteristics of each of the papers were extracted, that information was extracted out of the papers um, and um, collated into these tables. Uh, and that helped us go through that process of uh, organising and grouping the papers together. So um, right through down to uh, for example, the Freshman Success was one of these programs, um, which was uh, based on sort of positive psychology. And, um, you know, there, there are elements within the paper that we drew out. We found that, it, you know, there were four schools involved and it had a high impact on academic outcomes and on wellbeing. And so those sort of, that, that's the impact data that we extracted um, and, you know, fed into the overall systematic review results. So that was just to just give you a little snapshot of the different, you know, digging in more deeply into what constitutes the systematic review. Beautiful. Thank you, Catherine. What we'll do, we'll just, just because of time constraints, we'll move through, but all these slides will be available to you all. Um, we have responded to your questions within this. I'm just mindful that I don't want to hold any teachers or educators back from um, your lives. <laughs> um, so we'll just speed through these, but we'll be sending out this at the end. So what we'll do is we'll just go now to um, take home messages and what we'll do, we have received some questions tonight, so we can um, answer those for you as well and include those in the resource pack that we send out because we appreciate you giving those questions to us tonight and they're, they're lovely questions, but um, we don't want to run over time. So um, what I'll just ask our panellists now is, I guess just as a final question um, to you, Michael, and then to you, Catherine, what do you think are the most critical aspects of um, the implementation of, of, of CELL within your setting? I think for us, it is that it's a, it's, a, it's a whole school thing. It's a big picture thing and it's an ongoing thing. It's not a one day program. It's not a one week program. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of the constant work of our teachers and it's, it's a part of all of our curriculum. It's not just the wellbeing team down there at the other end. It is a part of our curriculum and it is a part of all of our curriculum. And particularly for us, it's actually a part of 
integrates really well with our focus on literacy and metacognition because by supporting our students um, to build their self-regulation and their, their knowledge of themselves um, and us caring for them, and one of our mottos is that we care, um, you know, it's, it's part of our whole culture. And there's lots of supports in place. There has to be lots of supports in place. We might use programs, but it's a, it's a whole thing. It's not a, not a thing you just add in sometimes. Yeah, and that's real. Sorry, go ahead, Catherine. No, okay. Um, I don't know how I'm going to lose it now. No. Um, just like, I obviously can't agree more with you, Michael, that uh, it's really critical that it's the whole school approach. Um, I think also what is critical is that it's, it changes hard. Like we know changing systems, changing ways we do things is hard. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, you know, if you work collectively as a team and you support each other in the process, that you really do engage with the importance of what developing wellbeing is, that you, you are working towards developing an adult for the future that is resilient, that is, you know, has those social emotional skills that, you know, these are 21st century skills we're talking about more than anything, um, that, are, that they're going to be successful adults because they've learned how to, cope with stress you know we're in crisis you know we've been going through crises after crises it seems and there's going to be more unfortunately you know so so what sort of humans do we need to build for the future that can cope with whatever is thrown at them um you know and that 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 sort of is at the core of making sure that they're they're strong that they're not anxious um you know that they they understand those challenges and, and have the skills and capacities to get themselves out of those challenging positions that they find themselves in, that they're resourceful and resilient, um, you know, uh, with whatever life's going to throw at them. And um, that's what we want to head towards. Um, and, you know, we need to do that for ourselves, absolutely, but also help um, our young people develop those skills as well. Lovely. I couldn't have said it better myself. In fact, you said it much better. That was beautiful um, from both of you that just that whole school picture and then really in the end is having in the mind's eye, well, what are, what's the type of human race we would like? How can we make ourselves and the future and the next generations as resilient as possible to these large obstacles that we've had to overcome this year and will continue to occur. But I am hopeful um, with the announcement this morning of the RNA vaccine. So there's a little bit of hope for everyone out there. That's really good news. Um, so thank you so much to the panellists. Oh, we've got one more webinar coming up and Michael, you're here again, which is pretty exciting for the group. Um, I'm sure that will bump registration numbers. It's exciting. So this will be led by um, Danielle Toon, who's also an Associate Director at Evidence for Learning, and this will be taking place next Tuesday. And this is officially the last webinar. We've said it before, but this is it. Um, so, and we're excited to have that for next week and have that really strong presence of um, school leadership voices in that and, and especially to showcase Michael's great work and the work of his team at Wodonga Senior Secondary College again. So we're going to send you a survey link to let us know what you thought of this webinar. We will reach back. We've noted your questions from today. We'll produce a deck um, in response to those questions that you've reached out. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. If you want to get in touch with us, that's the ways you can. You'll receive a certificate as well. Um, and you can connect with us on social media. So I would just like to finish off by saying just a really warm and heartfelt thanks to my outstanding panel tonight. Um, from Dr. Dix and Michael and from Pauline. Thank you all for your really strong and real life contributions about what this really crucial topic, and it's been crucial to me all along, but I think that it's 
and maybe this is an upside to the pandemic, is that we have focused in on it now and we're calling it out as being incredibly important for the for the future of the human race. So thank you all for your contributions tonight. And we'll be back next week for some of you. All right, take care and thank you. <laughs>